Hello, everyone. Books with Banks back again, and I'm thrilled today to be joined by Diana Gabaldon, author of the Outlander series and Lord John Side series and uh, numerous other works of uh, fiction, short fiction, uh, what have you. How are you today? No, great. Alex, how are you? I'm uh, doing great, doing great. Uh, again, thank you so much for coming on my channel. Uh, I was hoping we could maybe talk a little bit about your book series, the writing of them, sure. also mm -hmm. a little about the adaptation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure thing. All that sound good? Yeah, no problem. Um, so uh, I maybe first things first, um, kind of the first question is, along with how are you today, are you working on anything right now? What are you writing? Um, oh, hell no, there's yeah. a question. Yeah. Well, let's see. At the top of the pile would be book 10, which, you know, at the moment I intend to be the, the final big book of the Outlander series, but uh, you never know. Uh, suddenly there's a dog in my presence. Oh, Harvey, where did you come from? <laughs> With Lockie, won't be a problem. If he is, I'll get my husband to take him back downstairs. But yeah, anyway, uh, yeah, at the top is book 10, which is, you know, J.B. Clare and with luck, the wrap up of the multivarious threads I've been weaving throughout this. Oh, I, I, I don't plan books out ahead of time, let alone outline them. So I actually don't know. But, uh, you know, I mean, I wrote Outlander for practice and I thought that was it, you know, I was just gonna write a book for practice and then I'd write something else as it was, you know, here we are 10, <laughs> 35 years and 10 books later. <laughs> so, okay, so that's on the top. Uh, it takes me usually at least three to four years to write one of the big books. And that's not only because of the research and so forth, but also because um, it is a series. You know, people uh, may have started with the first book and then they got distracted or something. They go into a bookshop and they see my name and something interesting. They say, oh, I remember I like that book. And they grab that one only to realize it's the fifth book in the series. <laughs> or, you know, they've never heard of me before, but they run through the airport bookshop and here's a nice big book for the flight. Oh, my God, it's the ninth book in the series. Uh -huh. So I have to provide enough information that people who come on a book by itself can enjoy that book by itself without having read the rest of the stuff, but without so much detail that it frustrates the people who have read everything. So as you might imagine, that's very delicate engineering and it takes quite a long time to you know, fiddle things. Um, so anyway, that's on the top. Underneath that uh, would probably be the prequel, which is uh, the story of Jamie Fraser's parents, Brian and Ellen. And uh, you probably know that uh, Stars has already given the green light for them to make a, a television show, the prequel, which will be interesting because it's not written yet. But, <laughs> <laughs> but it will be a reasonably short book. <laughs> and okay. I, am, I am working on it now. And I've been talking to the Stars people about what I want to include. And they've been telling me about what they think they want to do. And, you know, they, they're, they want to do a few things that I'm pretty sure would not be in my book. And I just say, yeah, you know, you, you do what you want <laughs> because, you know, there's places in the show that, uh, that are like that. You know, they really wanted to do something and sometimes I'm like, oh God. <laughs> and sometimes I'm like, yeah, this sounds like a good idea. <laughs> you know? So, you know, uh, it is an adaptation and so will the prequel be. However, like I say, the prequel is actually three books and uh, fairly short ones. And that's because of the way that the history of the first Jacobite rising fell out. It falls naturally into three historical and geographical periods. So I thought, you know, for the sake of readers, if nothing else, I would, you know, put, try to put it in three smaller books rather than all in one huge book. Oh, that way they don't have to wait so long. So anyway, I'm working on the first of those, coming well. Now, underneath that, I have another of the Lord John novels. Okay. And this one is called The Black Chamber, and it deals with Lord John's adventures in British intelligence, you know, pr prior to <laughs> some of the other books, because there's a gap, you know, where he's not in the main storyline. And this is what he was doing while, while that occurred. Okay. okay, so that's kind of in the fiddling around stage. I just have little bits and pieces that show up and I make notes as to I find out about this or I stumble across something and think, oh, well, that'll work, that sort of thing. So it's, it's like, like that. And meanwhile, in the background, I'm putting together just the little bits and pieces that occur for the Outlandish Companion, volume three. Okay. There are two of these in print already. One covers the first four books and the second one covers the second four books so the final uh, thing will cover I think nine and ten and possibly the prequel but the companions are meant for people who want to know more about the background or who want to think well who is this character I know I've read about him there's a cast of characters with 500 entries and you can easily look them up alphabetically and see who that person was without having to flip back through all of the books so it's got you know things like uh like the remarks that I sent to Tobias uh, Menzies about uh, 
Black Jack Randall. He had asked okay. me, you know, what can you tell me about Black Jack Randall? And I said, well, I can tell you quite a few things, actually. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I wrote him all of the, this little dossier on, on that, and that is in the Outlandish Companion, Volume 2. Okay. So, you know, there'll be various things like that, and, you know, some of the more interesting interviews that I've done over the years. So all that kind of stuff. So anyway, Companion Number 3 is kind of on the bottom of this heap right now. Okay. Um, I, I guess, are, are any of those proven easier or more challenging to write than you you expected i mean i guess with book 10 there's probably a lot more continuity <laughs> or, or is there anything like that going in well the thing is i i not only don't write with an outline i don't write in a straight line okay. i write in bits and pieces where i can see things happening and so you know i will see an idea what I call a kernel and that can be anything a line of dialogue or something I've seen you know an object in a museum a, an ambience from a bottle, um, battlefield something like that anything that will give me a few words that I can write down and that's a kernel and then I sit there and stare at it and I take words out and I put them back in and meanwhile the back of my mind is kind of kicking through the compost and picking out mushrooms and juggling them and you know things begin to to fix yeah, there's a, a small piece online. It's actually on YouTube. And if you call it, if you type in Diana Gabble, don't writes a sentence, it'll pop right up for you. Okay. But it is a, it is a uh, um, an edited and encapsulated form of my party piece, which I do occasionally when I'm on, on stage. I did this for the Random House people when they had me do uh, uh, something for their programs. And it is just a demonstration of how I write, you know, uh, literally. <laughs> <laughs> And you can see how it works, but it's, it's where I, it, it's like playing Tetris in my head, but really slowly. Okay. So I don't have an outline, so I don't know exactly where I'm going. I will know a few big things. I mean, obviously I'm going to have the battle of Yorktown in this book because we're moving through the American revolution. Right. So, you know, we had Kings mountain in the last book and we had the battle of Monmouth in the book before that. So, you know, choose your fight essentially. <laughs> uh, yeah. So there's bits and pieces, but you know, I could just as easily be looking at something that uh, is in book 10, you know, and it may be a scene. I have several scenes with Lord John there. And so I'm much more in his head than I normally am in one of the big books that I am because of his circumstances in this book. And so he's thinking of things that essentially are connected to earlier parts of his life. And so I'm, I will come across something and I'm thinking, oh, that belongs in the black chamber, not here. <laughs> and so I will, you know, I'll quickly remove it to the, the <laughs> file for black chamber and, you know, uh, sort of go sideways back into the, the, the thread of what I'm doing in book nine. But I'll leave that pointer there because, you know, he's referring back to this experience in his mind. So that's a place where I would put in a little, uh, little thread, you know, for people who have not encountered Lord John before and have not read the Black Chamber of Chamber and all that. But that piece will be waiting for me when, when I open up the Black Chamber next time. And then I can expand on that and go off in whatever direction that has. But it's, it's very messy. Yeah. <laughs> it's basically it. <laughs> um, I guess uh, I I am curious. Uh, you you mentioned uh, Random House. They're your current publisher, uh, correct? Or yeah, yeah. Well, they've now been uh, they've gone through mergers and things. They are now officially Penguin Random House. <laughs> okay, right, right, right. So I guess on on that point, this series you've been writing the series for what thirty plus years? Uh, thirty five years now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How I mean, this my this type of question might call for like a really long answer. Uh, so you know, feel free to say as much or little as as you're comfortable with. Sure. But how has publishing changed to, from the late like 1980s to now? Yeah. Oh, amazingly, yeah, <laughs> on multiple levels. Uh, partly, it's just uh, you know the march of progress and the electronification of industry in general. I mean, back in the day when uh, I sold them Outlander, and in fact, they bought, uh, you know, they gave me a three book contract, much to my surprise, <laughs> but uh, it was a good thing. And uh, at that point, they didn't have computers in their offices at all. They didn't use word processors. They typed everything, which served me well because my husband uh, at that point had a, uh, a programming company that wrote code for uh, people who had PCs, as they were all called at that time. Mm -hmm. This was pre-Mac pre and everything else. Mm -hmm. And uh, essentially, if you bought a, uh, well, they were all laptop computers, but really big ones. And uh, they only had uh, Lotus 123, which is a spreadsheet. And um, Word, a very early, really buggy version of Word. I mean, even buggier and worse than the one they have now, which is, yeah. anyway, I wish there was some alternative, but there really isn't. <laughs> and uh, 
let's see. Oh, and uh, DBase4 was what you used for a database. If you wanted to do anything beyond what those functions did, you had to hire someone to write custom made code. So he did that. And as a consequence, he had this gigantic uh, uh, <laughs> PC, which had a dual operating system. You know, this is back when you had CMS and, and uh, DOS. Consequently, I, I could, I, I mean, I still know how to do DOS, which is a good thing too. So I can get into the command prompt and, you know, fix things that my laptop <laughs> is trying to do that I don't like. Yeah. Anyway, but the thing is, I did know how to do uh, word processing and work with the printing and things like that, use daisy wheels and so forth. Nobody in the publishing house did that. Okay, so I knew I had a really big book. I knew publishers don't like really big books right. because they're expensive to, to print and all that. So I was thinking, well, you know, if I actually print this out the way they like, which is, you know, Courier 10, because that's what a typewriter did back then. So if I take Courier 10 and double spaced and one inch margins, they're going to take one look at it and go, oh, no, this will never do and start trying to whack things out. And, you know, I write by the time I'm done, it's very delicately interwoven. I'm not in, disposed to hack things out just because they think it's too long. And so I thought, hmm. I said, well, you know, um, I know things they don't about word processing, like the difference between proportional fonts and monospace. And mm -hmm. so monospace is, of course, where a letter take each letter takes up the same space as any other letter. An M um, takes up the same space as an I or a Z or a T. They're all choop, 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 like that. Whereas a proportional space, an M takes up this room an eye takes up this room and so forth. Yeah, Consequently, okay. a proportional font will let you squeeze a whole lot more words on a line than monospace. But if it's readable, I figured they're not going to know the difference. Right, <laughs> you know? right. Yeah, if I do it in Times Roman 12 instead of Courier 10, you know, then I'm saving two points in type size, mm -hmm. but it's made up for by the legibility, they will not actually realize. You know, I mean, although it's not Courier 10, but as long as they can read it, they won't be worried about it. Likewise, I could adjust, you know, the letting and kerning. I didn't bother that much with the with the kerning, which is the space between letters, but the letting is the space between lines. Okay, so instead of making it double spaced, I made it line and a half spaced, okay. and uh, and I squeezed the margins into 0.9 inches instead of a whole inch. Consequently, uh, you know, it came out looking to them like a long but acceptable manuscript. They didn't learn the terrible truth until they sent it to the typesetter, who cast it off, and they came back. <laughs> My editor called up in shock and she said, do you have any idea how long this book is? I said, well, yeah, actually I do. <laughs> you know, too late now, isn't it? <laughs> and it was, you know, so they went ahead and printed it, and, you know, and they were all worried, you know, oh my God, nobody's going to read, you know, a romance that's this size. And I said, that's exactly what I'm counting on because, you know, I don't write romances. Uh, I never intended to. Uh, it's true that Outlander certainly has a romance in the, in the central storyline, but there's a whole lot of things that a romance novel, especially of the 1980s, would never do, <laughs> including what happened at Wentworth Prison and right, a few right. other things. <laughs> yeah. Also, um, well, you know, obviously, about romance novels and so forth. It's a really old, uh, very enduringly popular story form. It goes back to like the 13th century, if not farther. But the form is, is simple. It's a courtship story, you know, and when the courtship is over, they get married, they have a baby or something, they get together in a semi-permanent fashion. That's the end of the story. Romances do not have sequels. Right. And I knew there was more to my story and I had a three book contract. <laughs> I said, okay, think again. Anyway, I, I hadn't worried about what anybody might call it because, you know, it was obvious it didn't fit anywhere. So um, sometime after they had bought it and we're if, debating what to publish it as my agent called up and he said well they finally decided what to do with your book and he said they're going to publish the hardcover just as fiction uh, because <laughs> because you have a hardcover contract and so it has to be uh, it, it will have to go on the fiction shelf he said but they want to sell in the paperback as romance mind you they didn't have hardcover romance in this point uh -huh. so that's why they wanted to do the hardcover as fiction and the paperback as romance and I said that's what I said, you know, I enjoy well-written romance. I read it. I said, but uh, I read enough of it to know that's not what I wrote. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I said, beyond that, you know, oh, uh, the thing is, if you publish it as romance, it will cut off the entire male half of my readership. Mm. And I said, there are things in this book that men appreciate that women don't. Mm. And I said, I would not like to lose that. Well, my agent was a man. He said, yes, I understand. <laughs> he said, mm. <laughs> he said, we could insist that they sell it as science fiction or fantasy, which would appeal to the male leadership and not so much to the females. He said, but bear in mind that uh, a bestseller in SFF is 50,000 in paperback. 
said a bestseller in romance is 500,000. I said, you've got a point. So what was romance? Right. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, my uh, beyond money, my uh, thinking was that, uh, as my first editor said to me, these have to be word of mouth books because they're too weird to describe to anyone, which is also true. And so I said, well, that being the case, obviously, it makes sense to expose them to as many people as possible who will go off and spread word of mouth. So, okay, we'll sell them to 500,000 romance readers if we can, and that will make 500,000 people going around talking about this book, which will attract other people who are maybe not romance readers. And, you know, that actually happened. You know, this is, this is how the books got started. It, uh, by the fact that it was a hardcover, this was the, one of the brilliant things that the publisher did at the urging of my editor, they uh, sent the hardcover edition of Outlander to that year's uh, uh, RWA, Romance Writers of America convention, which is a, a big deal. I had never been to it because I didn't write romances, but anyway, they sent me to it uh, along with that. So I walked in to uh, the registration and talked to the person under the letter G, gave her my name, which I spelled, and she said, how do you spell that? Which everybody does. Well, she was sitting in front of this large stack of Outlander hardcovers. And so I pointed at them and said, like that. She looked at the books, <laughs> she looked at me and she said, it's you. <laughs> Apparently everybody there had been wondering what the heck, <laughs> because they'd never seen anything like that. So anyway, it, it went well, <laughs> I'll say that. Mm -hmm. Right, so anyway, right. that's where I started. I'm not sure I even answered what you asked me. But... No, that, 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 that's wonderful. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so I guess kind of um, with publishing recently uh, and mm. your books being the size oh, that, that they are, yeah, um, no. <laughs> I'm curious. I, I've heard just from others uh, just around that, um, especially with the pandemic and everything, that uh, publishing has really slowed down. No, oh, um, yes, no, you're sure, you're sure right about that. Yeah, yeah. no, it has. Like, was bees delayed uh, because of that, or like have you encountered to a certain to a certain extent? Yeah, uh -huh. the problem there was as always the size, because owing to the pandemic, uh, a great many businesses went out of business, and this included a lot of the book printing firms, which were reasonably small, and you know if they lost many of their of their people or were forced to close for a long period of time, they didn't have the finances to continue. So at the time Bees was printed, I don't know if this is still the case, there was one company left that could print a book that size. And therefore the scheduling for it was very tight and you had to get it exactly and a lot of shuffling and backstabbing amongst the publishers. Yeah, for sure. yeah so that was in fact a concern. And you know, then there's the, the social side of publishing, which has just gotten insane over the last you know five really on no more than five or six years but you know they, they fell for it hard you know and now there's all this nonsense i mean if i were writing outlander now i would undoubtedly get a lot of flack from people in the publishing industry about oh how dare you write about something in scotland you're not scottish oh of course, well, okay, gotcha. of course a lot of people think i am scottish you know, so they might not have thought of asking <laughs> Okay, okay. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm still, I'm waiting for the uh, mass market paperback of Go Tell the Bees. Uh, to, uh, uh, well, yeah, unfortunately, there will not be a mass market oh, in, okay, the, okay. in the U.S. Oh. because they said, owing to, you know, everything, including pandemic, they have very few distribution outlets for mass market paperbacks these days. And so they decided it was not economic to, to do that. However, uh, the Canadian uh, publisher, which okay. publishes exactly the same design, format, etc. It just has Double Day Canada on the spine instead of Bella Court, but it will look just the same. And they said they thought that would be out within the next year. So okay. you may have to wait a bit longer, but you will be able to get one. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, yeah, I'm still, um, I mentioned a little before we sure. uh, started recording, I'm uh, half, a little more than halfway through the fourth book. So I've got a little bit of time to- you got leeway. Yeah, yeah to catch up there. Um, yeah. Uh, so I guess maybe- uh, if you don't mind, maybe we can shift the conversation more to the content of the books themselves, uh, or maybe bridging that gap a little bit. Were there any segments of this story that you look back to, or particular books or particular sections of the books that you had a really great time writing, or others mm -hmm. that maybe were just much more challenging than, um, yeah. Well, they're very big books, so there's always spots of both kinds in, in a book. Um, I love battles. You know, they just okay. appeal to me on multiple emotional and logical levels. And, you know, the history is really interesting and exciting. So I love those parts are always um, deeply engaging for me to write. 
uh, and uh, you know, easy to a point in that I know what happened. And it's just how is it going to happen on the page? You know, whose point of view are we in? And you know, what are, what's around them? Because they will be seeing something different than someone else. Am I going to change the point of view from so and so to so and so? Well, yes, I have to. So back, it's very exciting. So back and forth. So you keep those sections brief because you're just it's like cut action film. Sure. And, uh, you know, whereas in another place uh, that's moving slower, it might be a scene that involves a number of people, say, around a dinner table or there's a meeting of the generals or something like that, that will move a lot slower and it will involve many, many more viewpoints. And uh, so that will have a much different pace. And those are, in a way, easier to write because they require a little less craftsmanship in the fitting. But at the same time, they require the same amount of detail and work and uh, how do you do the dialogue? If you have dialogue from a historical document, I mean, somebody actually quoted what somebody said at this meeting, you can use that and it will give flavor, but then you have to preserve that voice for whatever else that person may have said, which you're making up. So there's a, that's, it's just a different kind of working. All right, all right. Uh, I guess maybe uh, on the point of point of view, uh, I, I, found it fascinating how the first book, I guess, is entirely uh, Claire's first person point of yes, view. Yes, that's right. Uh -huh. And then we start to get, I guess, a couple chapters in the second one from Roger's mm -hmm. third person, or is it third limited in the second one? Um, yeah. <laughs> and then with the same with Jamie and, and the third one, I guess I'm curious how you went about choosing which characters to, uh, which characters' viewpoints to, to use and mm -hmm. to explore. Well, it's a matter of who has the most at stake. You know, through the first one, we kind of, well, I wrote that book for practice, as I say. So it didn't occur to me that you have to ever to change the viewpoint because, you know, it's a, a specific type of adventure book. It's a quest book, fish out of water, stranger in a strange land. You know, I've read a number of books like that over the years, many of them older books, you know, like uh, Robinson Crusoe and so forth. And they always stay in the head of the person who is the castaway or the stranger or whatever, as they should. And so I wrote it that way. Okay, well, come along to Dragonfly and Amber. And I'm thinking, well, that way. <laughs> in the sequel what happened so that one took a lot a lot of thought and then I was thinking well you know maybe it doesn't need to be completely in Claire's voice you know I may get tired <laughs> of just having that one voice and also I, I don't like to do things that I've done before so I always like to do something different so I said okay well you know what about uh, you know Jamie's voice or Roger's voice is actually Roger's voice because of the structure of that story you know, because, you know, we had to deal with what actually happened and why is she back and all this sort of stuff. And so I decided to start with, in her point of view, with her going to call on Roger and, you know, put this before him. And then we fall back into the long flashback, which is in her voice again, but with, with Jamie. <laughs> all right. uh, and are, are there any of those characters that you enjoy writing from the most or like, like any, anyone that surprised you that uh, mm -hmm. you know, anyone's voice that maybe came out of nowhere or it's just like, oh, wow, this is fun. Well, that, that often happens. Yeah. In fact, if they don't talk to me, then I usually <laughs> I kind of ignore them or leave them out. <laughs> but yeah, no, I uh, I enjoy the, the the Quakers, you know, Rachel and Denzel Hunter. <laughs> okay. And yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you, know, you always have to be very careful with the V and uh, stuff. You know, there are actually rules to Quaker plain speech. And I keep people writing to me and saying, well, why aren't they saying thou dost? And so, oh. <laughs> said, because in the 18th century, they weren't doing that. <laughs> and they were just substituting the, where we would use the you. And I said, that's the old form. That's how everybody did it back then. But they didn't change the tense. Um, they, it's just you. Like we would say you rather than use her. <laughs> or, <laughs> which in fact is the correct plural of you, or it was, mm -hmm. is use. And it's preserved in some parts of the U.S. <laughs> And you'd say use guys, meaning right. all of you, all of you guys, <laughs> things like that. So, you know, to deal with the speech, you have to know who this character is, but you also need to know things like, where did they come from? Is there regional speech? You know, if I were writing an Irish character, which I seldom do, because I don't have a good grasp of, of that dialect, that I would need to, uh, well, read books written by Irish novelists. That's how I got the Scottish accent, was reading things written by Scottish people. Also listening to, uh, you know, Scottish music, especially with live bands, because they'd banter with the audience in between the, the, the lyrics of the folk songs they were singing. So I managed to pick up quite a lot. And then I'd watch BBC television and pick out the, the Scottish characters and so forth. So that's where I got the Scottish accent and so forth. So I, um, I, I would really I, I'd regret it if I didn't bring this up but I have since seen like clips of interviews and kind of explanations mm -hmm. explaining that 
I guess what I'm about to mention is in fact the case. But my brother, he's currently in the Peace Corps. So in his downtime, mm. he's watching a lot of TV that he uh, never watched. And he's catching up on a lot of the old Doctor Who. Uh, ah. <laughs> and he um, got to, I guess, is it the second Doctor? That's or, right. <laughs> earlier on. And uh-huh. so on the credits, um, James uh, McCrimmon's name next to Fraser. Um, Fraser uh, Hines. Yeah. Right, right, right. right. And yeah. he texted and he said, "You ha- if you ever talk to Diana Gavel, then you have to ask her if this is if this is yeah. why James Fraser is is no <laughs> no actually not you would think so but that was very fortuitous the thing is uh where I was it was Phoenix Arizona is where I was watching all this and I had a very busy life I was a university professor I was writing freelance for the computer uh, magazines and I had uh, children and so the only time I ever watched television was on Sunday afternoon with the family we watched Doctor Who because it was just enough time for me to paint my nails that's the only time free time I had so anyway the thing was it was on PBS uh, public broadcasting uh, station and uh, they had you know, fundraising things pledge programs which they would do and they would squeeze them in at the end of programs and to do that they would cut off the credits and then you'd have some Uh, people are begging for money instead so in fact i never saw the credits for that season of doctor who (laughs) so i didn't know who was playing jamie mccrimmon (laughs) it was several years later i found out i was like yeah no fraser came about because of the research i was doing i was reading a book called uh, the prince and the heather by a guy named eric Linklater. Okay. And uh, this had to do with what happened after the Battle of Culloden. You know, that Bonnie Prince Charlie uh, fled the field with a small number of followers. And then he made his way, uh, it took him five months to get out of Scotland because he was having to move quickly every night to keep them from catching up with him. And uh, so it, uh, a part of this book was a flashback to the end of, of, of Culloden and what happened after, after he left and all that. And they said that, uh, you know, a number of the people on the field were just buried where they lay. They said 19 Jacobite officers uh, who were wounded took refuge in the, the cottage, the little farmhouse by the field, mm-hmm. which is still there, Leonak farmhouse is gone. And he said they lay there for two days with their wounds untended in pain. And he said at the end of that time, they were all taken out and shot. He said they're, they're buried in the field nearby. And he said one man, a Fraser of the Master of Lovett's mm-hmm. Regiment, survived this this execution and uh, was uh, was rescued from the field and I thought well you know if I expect my hero Jamie I had his name Jamie he just kind of came with it well Jamie McCrimmon um I said well if I expect him to survive the battle of Culloden maybe his last name had better be Fraser (laughs) so that's where I got it (laughs) wonderful wonderful well you just never know what's going to (laughs) happen um let me see here. Sorry, I, I had a list of uh, some sort of prepared kind of ideas. Sure. Uh, talking mm-hmm. points. Um, I guess uh, I am curious, uh, maybe before you were writing the series, when you were starting out versus nowadays, are there areas of history that uh, you just really love studying? Um, like, did you, yeah, I, I guess, did your interest or historical interests ever shift around from Scottish history to like revolutionary colonial America history or is it just kind of all just adding on top of itself? (laughs) Well it kind of morphs you know as you go along and in fact colonial American history revolutionary area uh, followed naturally from Scottish history you know the Scottish history moved to through the Jacobites and then that caused uh, was lost and the highlands were crushed. I mean, absolutely crushed. Their society was destroyed. Half the people were killed or or transported. There was really nothing left. And I had people after the first or second book say, oh, but I want to read about Scotland. Why aren't we back with Scotland? I like all the plaids and the broadswords. I'm saying, were you not reading? You know, <laughs> did you not pay attention to the end of Dragon Fly and Amber? It's all gone, you know. And I went back, it would be a story of people, you know, scrabbling for their lives and freezing to death in the winter. It's just, you know, not that adventurous. And uh, so I said, well, we're not going there. You know, what, <laughs> what happened to people after the Battle of Culloden? And, uh, you know, many of them were transported to America, to the Caribbean and so forth. And I said, well, I have a good idea about American history because you know, I was raised in a time when they actually taught that in school and right. regarded as, you know, hideous and profanity. Uh-huh. Um, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. So I said, okay, I went to America. And, uh, and uh, so we just picked up the history in the late 18th century and went on with it. 
Okay, great. great. Uh, are, are there any uh, areas of history that you're really interested in that just aren't maybe close enough or like easy enough for you to get your characters to that part of history? Anything like that ever happen? It would be difficult because they're not all time travelers. You know, I could move, you know, Claire or Brianna or Roger, say, to a different period, but Jamie can't go with them. So what kind of story would that be? You know? <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, if I were going to live forever, I could probably do, do something with their descendants, you know, and whether they wanted to go someplace else or I wanted them to go someplace else. There's, you know, room to, uh, to wiggle around that. But for what I'm writing now, this is Jamie and Claire's story. And people... Well, because it's a feminist age and all that. Well, it's Claire's story. She's such a strong woman. <laughs> I'm going, no, it's actually Jamie's story. She's just telling it. You know? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's his time period. His story. Yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, she has been thrust into this time. So, you know, naturally it is their story together. But uh, but it's, a, it's not, you know, a feminist tract or anything like that. If I read anything about strong women, I may... <laughs> I mean, enough already. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I guess, would you mind if uh, maybe we shifted to talk a little bit about no, the education itself? Um, yeah. So uh, I, I'm curious how how involved you were with the, w w I guess, with stars in production when the show started mm -hmm. versus are mm -hmm. you still, do you have the same level of involvement? Uh, I probably have a little more now than I had when I started. But the thing is, um, they bought the, the stars bought the, the show rights largely because it, the books had such a large readership. So after the success of Game of Thrones, they were looking deliberately for a large series of books with a big readership and you know, there I was. So uh, they were very interested in that to start with. And it was obvious that George had had quite a lot to do with, uh, with his show. And so they kind of wanted to replicate that. And you know, also uh, they talked to me and <laughs> we got along and uh, they gave me a contract which made me a consultant to the show. And I asked my agent, I said, what exactly does that mean? What do they want me to do for them? And he said, well, it varies, you know, it's a, there's no defined meaning to it. And he said, for most consultants, uh, they just want you to go away, you know, take the money and don't bother them. He said, but, you know, if you happen to get along with these people and they're interested in your opinions, then you can work out a way of how much do they want you to, how much input do they want? And so that's basically how it worked out. You know, I, I wanted to remain involved and uh, since, their entire audience was composed of the book readers at that point. It was to their benefit to keep me involved and visible and so forth. And I got along with them all. And so, so you know, I gradually evolved over the years. You know, Ron left after the third season. And, uh, you know, I was having lunch with him in L.A. one day, you know, in, during the, the third season. And uh, you know, he was looking rather <laughs> careworn. And we were quiet for a few minutes. And I looked at him and I said, the show is going to kill you, you know. <laughs> He sort of sighed, sat back, and he said, "Well, I pretty much come to that conclusion too. So I'm stepping back." You know? <laughs> and he did. You know, he had other ideas. He had uh, a show that he wanted to make that was, you know, his. It wasn't based on something else. It wasn't an adaptation. It was originally his, which I thought was a great thing for him. Yeah. But after that, you know, then there was reshuffling of how do things work. Because Matt Robertson and Merrill Davis, of course, have been involved since the beginning, and Merrill is is still Ron's partner uh, with with his show, uh, For All Mankind, I believe it's called. And uh, Matt uh, actually started all this years and years and years before, by, because he was a uh, reader for Paramount, and so he read books that came in and evaluated them for their filmic potential. Anyway, he fell madly in love with Outlander at that point. <laughs> and it's a long story, but all that had to do with how it ended up in Ron's hands. <laughs> so. uh, were you um, very involved in the casting process at all? Oh, uh, no, no, okay. I have nothing to do with that. Okay. Yeah, we have an excellent casting. I mean, how would I know? <laughs> I, couldn't, I wouldn't even know how to find an actor, let alone evaluate them. But uh, we have a wonderful casting director who's been with the show from the beginning. Uh, uh, Suzanne uh, Smith, I think. <laughs> Okay. And uh, she's done a wonderful job. Uh, if she hasn't made a wrong decision yet. Everybody she's picked has been absolutely wonderful for their parts. And so, yeah, I guess if maybe you weren't involved in the selection, uh, do no. you um, spend much time discussing the characters with them? Kind of, I guess you had mentioned that um, Tobias Menzies had 
We have questions, Absolutely. yes. Well, you know, given the character of Blackjack right. Randall, you would. But, uh -huh. uh, let's see. Uh, and I discussed Jamie at, at considerable length with Sam Hewitt. Uh, not so much with Katrina. She had a few questions, which I answered. And, you know, we, we get along very well. We're friends and she'll ask me a question once in a while. But um, but no, I never sat down and, you know, dissected Claire because she's got her own take and she, and she does it really, really well. Uh, other than that mostly not um occasionally one of the of the other characters will you know ask me a, something specific about their character you know would he or she do this or could you tell me a little bit about the background of this and i can but that's very rare i um i guess i, I should ask uh, have you tried any of sam hewan's uh, spirits uh, any of his his gin oh. or his <laughs> He gave me a bottle of his whiskey, <laughs> okay, <yeah. laughs> which is very good. <laughs> oh yeah, we uh we actually he was um I, I live in South Florida and he was just oh, here yeah. for like a meet and greet uh thing. And, uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, uh, oh, nice. We uh, my fiance and her mom were able to to go in and meet oh, him. Oh great! And uh -huh. Uh -huh. So, no, that was a nice time. Yeah, yeah. he's a very nice guy. <laughs> it, it seems like it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Um, I. Have any of the actors or perform, or I, I guess I should also ask, do you watch the show regularly? I assume when the new episodes come out, do you watch them as soon as they come out or? Well, I am a consultant, which means that they show me everything. Sure. They show me okay. the scripts and all their iterations. They show me all the daily footage that they take, which is a lot of fun when they're shooting. I get like five days a week when they send me, you know, an hour of, of uh, dailies or more. And they show me the episodes as they're put together. You know, they also go through multiple versions and uh, will end up with what they call a locked cut which sometimes they'll change even so if there's something important. But basically I have seen absolutely everything about a show if, not long before it hits the, the airways. I do watch, you know, the finished uh, product with, with all of the little bits and pieces. You know, there's things that's called VX, VFX is what it's called. And that means special effects. And so they'll put something at the base of a, a filmic thing, uh, one of the takes, and it will say VFX, remove town, and then we have a modern town in the background, and poof, it's gone, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> That's fascinating uh, to watch. <laughs> are Are there any uh, any performances that have really blown you away, or like surprised you, maybe actors taking characters in a direction you mm -hmm. just didn't think about, or yeah? Yeah, well, you know, that is largely between the director and the actor. And there are actors who will, you know, do something on their own and normally it works very well. Yeah, so, you know, I, I don't get involved with that at all, but I'm always admiring when they do it. Uh, the first time I'm, that happened that startled me was um, in the first season, you know, when Jamie is about to be flogged in a, at, at oh, prison and he's you know, manacled to the post and so forth. And uh, Jack Randall is walking around him, you know, poking him in the back and, you know, making <laughs> snotty remarks and so forth. Yeah. And finally he comes around to, to the front where I can look at his face and he was, you know, shaking from the cold and all that. And uh, instead of what was written in the script, which was frankly rather bad, uh, Tobias instead looked at him and said, are you scared? And I was thinking, yes, <laughs> you got it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and that was Tobias's ad lib because he understood that character. <laughs> okay. I said, that's exactly right. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> so yeah, sometimes that'll happen. <laughs> All right. Um, and I, I heard, um, I, of course, you know, correct me if I'm wrong. I heard that stars is aiming to wrap up the show with the, the, an eighth season. Uh, yes. is that, I I'm guess, will that mean they'll have to compress a lot of the final few books or. Well, they've already been doing that. Okay, right, okay. <laughs> yeah. Season seven, they've compressed, um, I see the sixth, uh, seventh, and eighth books. They've okay. taken pieces from all of those, though mostly from the sixth and uh, from the seventh and eighth books. And uh, so the eight, season eight will probably include a little bit of season of the of book eight and book nine, and probably whatever I've written of book ten at that point. Okay. So yeah. <laughs> gotcha. Um, are, do Do you mind if I ask? No. With the way that Game of Thrones ended and a lot of the mm -hmm. backlash mm -hmm. to that, uh, were there any, I, I guess when that happened, were there any concerns about Outlander? Um, 
well, yeah, people are like to me all the time. <laughs> oh my God, what are you going to do? You've got to write faster. And I'm going, no, I'm going to write like I always do. It's going to be fine. Don't worry. You know, uh, so, you know, we have to talk back and forth. I, I talk to Matt and Merrill all the time about, you know, what are the possibilities for doing this? Uh, they will call and say, well, we're thinking maybe we would do this. What do you think about that? And I say, yeah, that sounds fine. You know, uh, maybe you could, you know, tie it into this or sometimes they'll say, well, we think of doing this. And I'm going, mm, I don't know about that. Maybe you don't want to do that because you have this coming up and, you know, it's going to interfere with that. But, you know, it's, it's your show. You got to make your own decisions. So, you know, we, uh, it, it works out <laughs> and we have talked about the, the end of season eight and what we think would work. They know what I think will work and, you know, and they more or less like it. It doesn't mean they won't think of something they like better because <laughs> this is always their option, but uh, at the moment we're, we're good. <laughs> uh, and then I guess, uh, then will you be, um, will you hold the same uh, consulting role with the prequel series? Yes, as well? yes, I will. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Right. Uh, wonderful. Um, I guess uh, another question might be, how do you feel or do you feel that fan perception and response to your books was before the show aired versus was it any different after the show started coming out? Well, yes, um, because suddenly we had show only people who had right. never read the books. And so they have a different version, of course, of the story in their heads. And then we had people who have read the books and, you know, were so glued to the, the version that was in their heads that they had trouble initially dealing with the show because it was like, oh, he doesn't look like that. You know, he doesn't look like, I don't know why, but they, a lot of them would expect a character to look exactly like their mental picture of the character from the book. And, so I would always say, how do you expect the casting director to look into your head and pull out your individual image and then find an actor to match it? You know, this is not happening. <laughs> you know, you're just going to have to adapt. And most of them did, you know, without much trouble. Um, often people who have read the books and watched the show lose track of which is which because, you know, there's a lot of overlap. And they'll be saying, oh, but this happened here uh, when I'm talking about the books. And somebody else will say, no, no, that's the show. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, it's very amicable by and large. <laughs> Okay. Uh, I guess, have you, have you received any surprising negative or positive uh, criticism that Really? No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. yeah. Okay. I mean, there's always people who are negative about something in the show because they think it should be exactly like the book. Right. And, you know, I explained for the thousandth time how adaptation works and, you know, you only have so much room. In fact, they can, they could not fit more than 10% of one of my books into the space that you have in a season. And so they have to pick and choose their events and they do a really good job of it. You know, and then there's the dialogue. Um, some writers will use a lot of the original dialogue, which I, of course, think is a good idea. Yeah. But others of them won't. Um, and, you know, the, the book readers get upset when that happens because they're saying, well, you know, it should have been this way in the book. And why did they do that? Oh, my God. <laughs> But, you know, this, this is normal for any sort of public entertainment. Everybody's got their own uh, perceptions. And in fact, uh, no two people ever read the same book. You know, it's always going to be a different experience, depending on your background, your perceptions, your expectations, your prejudices. And um, often people will re write to me and say, oh, well, I love the books up to, you know, it's usually fairy cross. And then I just thought, well, this is dull. You know, I don't want to read this. And I said, wait, five years. Read it again. See what you think. And yeah. invariably, I get letters, not necessarily from them, but I get letters from people saying, oh, you know, from the first time I read Fiery Cross, I thought it was, you know, kind of dull and, you know, wandered around. And then I just read it again. And, oh, my God, it just spoke to me. And I said, you're five years older. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that you're going to read, uh, every time you read those books, they're going to be different because you are older. You're identifying with a different facet of what's being said. Mm -hmm. um, on that point, then, uh, is that possibly or is that part of the reason why when when Jamie and Claire when there's this 20 year time jump mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. then you also still maintain there, there's younger characters as well yes. is that mm -hmm. so that maybe younger audiences might identify a little bit more with Roger and Brie or um, no. anything like that or okay <laughs> no I never do anything for the audience you know? <laughs> I mean, the audience can take it or leave it, you know, I, I, I tell the story the way that I think it should be told, you know, as it is, you know, uh, Brianna exists because Claire was pregnant at the end of the first book. And I said, consequently, there has to be a child. Okay, who is she? So I had trouble with her during Dragonfly, because I didn't, she didn't come organically with the story, so to speak. And she wasn't an adult. And I was thinking, well, you know, 
where am I going to pick her up? You know, she's six years old and we have Claire, you know, having fits because she's, you know, a flunking kindergarten or something. Right, that doesn't right. seem right. Yeah. And so I said, well, I'm going to pick her up as a young adult. I can deal with that. You know, I, kids are not that interesting except in small doses. Yeah. Went to read about, I mean, and okay. uh, yeah, I mean, I have three children and they were of course <laughs> fascinating all along. <laughs> well, they're now 41, 39 and 37. So they're much more fascinating. But anyway, you, you uh, as I say, Brianna existed because Claire was pregnant and then she just moved along with the story as uh, we got along. And so uh, Roger was kind of organic, you know, uh, he existed because Claire needed a way to look into the past. She needed a historian. I sure, said, okay. okay, all right. And it would be nice if uh, the historian hit it off with Brianna. I wasn't sure they were going to, but they eventually did. And, you know, things like that. I, I As I say, I don't plan the books out. I, I think of what I need <laughs> here or there or whatever. And then I try it. Sometimes it doesn't work and I try something else. But I, Do you mind if we maybe talk about Roger for a little bit? Oh, um, no, no, I love Roger. <laughs> okay, so Roger is an interesting, he's an interesting character, uh, I think. Just, yes. Yeah, um, uh -huh. I just from like the group that I watched the show with and I uh -huh, know uh -huh. reading the books, uh, people have very strong opinions about Roger. Uh, I bet and, they do. <laughs> yeah. uh, and I don't think he's the type of person I, at least in books two, mm -hmm. three, four, at least right now, it's not necessarily the type of person that I would get along great with uh, in the uh -huh. real world. Um, but I, I am curious if maybe some of his more frustrating characteristics, if those are in there as part of like he, kind of his starting point. So then his adventure transforms him. Is that part mm -hmm. of the Roger character? Arc yes, it is. is uh -huh. really okay. Yeah. Because uh -huh. he's, uh, you know, kind of at loose ends when we when we first meet him and so forth. You know, his father's just died. You know, he's a, a young professor, not sure that this is what he wants to spend the rest of his life doing, but what else is he going to do? He is interested in history, though. And so when Clark comes to him with this this thing and then we go into other things and and when, when he realizes that he can time travel and so forth and then things kind of break loose you will like him much better as you progress through the books but he becomes older and he discovers what he's really meant to do in life which is one of his he has a somewhat longer character trajectory than many of the others so it, it takes him a while to figure out you know what, what is he good for? What can he do? You know, who, who actually is he? But he does figure it out and uh, he becomes a very strong character in the, in the later books. Oh, I, I think about where I'm at. Uh, he just very much, he really likes Brie and he's uh -huh. very focused on that. And yeah, uh -huh. and that's about it. He's not going any farther. <laughs> And he's frustrated <laughs> having to get rid of his, uh, having to get rid of the reverence things. Oh, well, yeah, uh -huh, yeah, yeah, no. yeah, he's young and he's adrift, you know, sure, and yeah. uh, so Bree is kind of his first anchor and Claire and so forth. And between the two of them, they're kind of slinging him in, into the direction that he needs to go. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but yeah, he's a young character and he develops and he grows. So does Brianna. <laughs> Okay. And a lot of, of people, they're all women who hate Brianna because, oh, she's such a brat. You know, she's so, <laughs> I just want to slap her because she doesn't think Interesting. Okay. that it's wonderful that Jamie Fraser is her father. She should be so proud and <laughs> thrilled that Jamie Fraser is her father. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, but them too. I said, just keep reading. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'd say the, um, the, the more, uh, I guess, the more passionate uh, conversations mm -hmm. I, I've kind of been part of around a character have not so much been about Brie, more about uh -huh. Roger and why is he, or <laughs> why, why is he hung up on certain decisions? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh, things uh -huh. like that. Um, but I, I and don't get me wrong, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll enjoy a character even uh -huh. if I don't find them like particularly friendly yeah. or like likable. Like it's still, yeah. uh -huh. it's still fun to read from their perspective. And, Absolutely. And, yeah. mm -hmm. I trained in, um, uh, I uh, got my degrees in history. And so oh, right. there's uh -huh. that connection to Roger. And so I, yeah. I, uh -huh. I, I uh -huh. do enjoy seeing certain exactly. things. Uh -huh. uh, also, I, I really love how in your books, you, I, I feel like there's this great contrast always between what Claire's familiar with from the mid 20th century and what's going on in the, uh, the 1980s and yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly so yeah no that's exactly right yeah, yeah Claire just... always remains in her own uh 
time warp, you might say, because, right. you know, people are embedded with the, uh, the milieu in which they grew up, became educated, the great events that happened. You know, Clara is always going to be this tough combat nurse, you know, no matter what else happens to her, she's only going to fall back on that. But she will have a different perspective on various things, medicine included. She knows modern, quote, modern medicine in that she's familiar with antibiotics, anesthesia, and antisepsis, which are the three pillars of modern medicine. But her medical uh, knowledge stops in 1968. She's not familiar with things like MRI machines and so right. forth because nobody was. And so you have to maintain the correct cultural context for your various characters. You know, this person, you know, was born in this year, they're not going to know anything about what happened over here, whereas this person will. And so are they going to tell that person? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe they're just going to, you know, carry on in their own context. But what they do will be colored by their own, uh, own thing. You know, character just doesn't exist in a vacuum. They are the result of all the influences that they encounter, some of which may be external to the book. Oh, sure. Um, I, I guess also kind of on the time travel kind of mm -hmm. aspect of the books uh, i i really like this idea that you play around with of um can we change the past or yeah. <laughs> in changing the past are we actually dooming everything to happen exactly how it happened anyway exactly. um, <laughs> was there like a i guess did you what was the process like for coming up with what type of time travel you wanted these books to be about or like I guess how much they could change the past mm -hmm. would there mm -hmm. be branching futures what what was that like kind of thinking thinking those things well well, um, once I realized that Claire was a time traveler, which was quite early on in you know, writing Outlander I uh, stopped reading time travel books because I didn't want uh them to contaminate my process, so to speak, or to be inadvertently lifting stuff. But I had read, of course, a number of them as a teenager and so forth. I used to read science fiction a lot, and then I became crime novels, <laughs> which is the usual progression. Anyway, um, I had read enough of them to realize that anyone writing time travel novels um, has to come up with their own explanations for how time works. And so I was thinking, well, how do I think time works? And I kind of concluded that it is um, a very organic process and uh, it, it depends on numbers, essentially. You know, if you have uh, a number of people who are pushing on one side, say, of an election or a battle or something, then you have people pushing the other way. Okay, the side with the greater numbers is probably going to win. And then that's what goes down in history. That doesn't mean these people were not important. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so you remember them. But the, the, the greater knowledge will, and that's what causes historical events, is a number of people pushing in one direction or another. You know, the French Revolution would have worked out differently if the aristocrats had, you know, been decently armed and had an army and so forth. It would have been a lot different. <laughs> and so consequently, you can get spots where you have a single person who has a great deal of social power and they can uh, exert enough uh, force to cause an event to happen. Otherwise, it's going to be social forces, you know, which you can see, you know, if you look at the modern news, you can just see yeah. this happening in front of you. <laughs> so I figured yeah. so that's how it happens. And therefore, a time traveler who goes to a different time has no more power than a person of that time. So even though Claire, you know, has all this knowledge and so forth, in the 18th century, she has no more power to affect things than anybody else she meets up until she is uh, acquainted with Bonnie Prince Charlie. At that point, her knowledge gives her power because as she tells Jamie, we could kill him and that would that would at least change this particular outcome. You know, the Scots might still be doomed, but it, it wouldn't be a Culloden. Something else might happen. Undoubtedly, it would have because, you know, their cause was uh, inadequately funded. They were dealing with Scottish clans who did not get together all that well. And, uh, you know, it was very scattered. It would not have held together long enough for, you know, they might have reached London, that's always been a question to people. Should they have turned back at Derby or should they not? And that we still don't know. But it was you know, touch and go at that point. There, the forces were approximately equal. Now, the chances, knowing what we know about history and so forth now, that if they had taken London, they could not have held it. But what would have happened after that, we don't know. So, But they didn't get as far as London, so we don't worry about that. And so we just deal with, with what we have on the ground, what we do know about what happened. And you can see those forces pushing back and forth. And occasionally you will find some place where some particular person, because of where they were placed, suddenly had a lot of power. George Washington was one of those. 
you know, if we had not had George Washington, we would not have America the way it is today. <laughs> I mean, no question about it. <laughs> so, you know, anybody who knew that, uh, and in fact, there were any number of plots to kill or abduct George Washington. None of them worked, luckily <laughs> enough, but, they, but people saw that and they were trying to take him out for that reason. So that's one of the things. So basically that's my overall notion of how it works is that a time traveler has only their knowledge, but no more actual uh, power than that. So say you went back to the French Revolution and you were friends with the local barber, you played checkers with him and so forth. It's getting close to what you know as D-Day. And you're right. saying, well, I tell you what, Jacques, maybe you don't go down to the Place de la Concorde tomorrow. Let's you know, take right. a nice drive in the country because <laughs> yeah, you can't stop what's going to happen, but right. you can save the barber. <laughs> okay, so you have, uh, you have local influence. Let's say. You don't lose any of the social power that you would have as, a, as an inhabitant of that time period. You just don't have more unless you find yourself in one of those special places. Okay. Um, I, maybe uh, the French Revolution, any plans on ever writing anything in that setting or? We might, because okay. at this point we actually have members of the, of the uh, ensemble who are in France, you know, oh, whose okay. lives may okay. be at, at risk at that point. Okay. Yeah. So we might, you know. <laughs> Okay, because okay. yeah, I, I, I um, studied a lot of uh, modern European history, um, but mostly continental Europe. So right. I, I didn't do mm -hmm. that much with uh, with what was happening in the British. Right. Um, uh -huh. so, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, so I yeah. find all of that very fascinating. And that yeah. might be why Dragonfly and Amber is my favorite so far. Yeah, well, I, I don't think I have too many more questions um, that's great uh -huh. uh, it, I, I, you know I don't want to keep you uh, too long uh, oh, that's all right uh -huh. we've already been going for almost an hour or so that's good uh -huh. okay well it's been a great pleasure talking to you um I'm trying to think if there's anything I have to be telling people but I don't think there is uh I think everybody knows that uh season seven is 16 episodes but it's being shown in two parts and we've seen part one which is the first eight episodes and the next eight will be shown sometime in 2024 but i don't know when uh, uh, i guess uh can you confirm and you know i don't want to uh, necessarily mm -hmm. get, get anyone in, into trouble or anything but is the writer strike um or oh the, yes <laughs> has that been <laughs> yeah no that's a will that affect when it releases or uh, not directly because uh -huh. it's already been filmed. It's already been through production. It, it exists. They just, uh, you know, are, are get, well, originally they intended to give the actors a hiatus, you know, before showing it so that they had time to do some of their other stuff. Right. And then they were going to start uh, filming season eight and, and the prequel were kind of overlapping. But while season seven, part two was showing and uh, they can't do that because, uh, well, I'm a member of the WGA because I write scripts and okay. so I am officially on strike. Uh -huh. I can't work on scripts until it's settled and neither can anyone else. In fact, you know, the production people cannot tell me stuff about uh, season eight or the prequel other than what we discussed before the strike happened. Sure. Yeah, so uh, so things are going to be pushed out farther basically as the uh, as the event, but that's happening to absolutely every show there is. And there's right. nothing being filmed because they can't. Right. And, right. Uh, and it's very hard on people, especially, uh, you know, the, the ongoing shows because it affects not just the actors or the producers, but, uh, you know, the camera people, the, the crew, the costume designers, everybody, nobody can work because they can't, they can't be filming. Sure. <laughs> Oh. Yeah, so yeah, sorry, it's very hard. <laughs> yeah, sorry to go down kind of that more. Oh, more no, no, no problem at all. Yeah. yeah. Well, a lot of people have no idea how it works. I didn't when I started here. So I'm always happy to answer anything I can. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, maybe uh, just one final question uh, before, before we go. Any fans of your series or for any fans of your series, uh, I am curious uh, if you'd have historical or works of... Uh, just historical like research books monographs things like that that you'd recommend any secondary literature that you'd recommend well there's vast quantities i'm looking at my bookshelves here which have uh, this is 
one of my three libraries. <laughs> this has roughly 2,500 books in that shelf over there, most of which I have used in the in this. And it goes everywhere from you know actual historical accounts and biographies of the of the main actual people in the books to you know the uh, government uh, production, which is interesting. The government printing office prints all kinds of arcane stuff, including a list of all the hurricanes that happened over the last 200 years up wow. until 1945, I think. Oh. So if I want to know if there was a hurricane at a certain point in the 18th century, <laughs> I can find it. <laughs> Things like that. Uh, so uh, the answer basically is no. Um, okay. <laughs> Google will do as good a job as I could. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, well, um, yeah, then I, I guess uh, other than that, before we go, I just want to say thank you so much for uh, yeah, writing the series um, and uh, and also for researching as much as, uh, I mean, going into just how certain crafts and, or like certain normal household things were done uh, back, back yeah, then. Yeah, well, that's it's fascinating. Yeah, I love that yeah. stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, it's been a great pleasure talking to you, Alex, and I'll look for, as I say, uh, just, you know, send me a link when when the th piece is put up, and I'll, uh, I'll put that on my, uh, it's not Twitter anymore, but I'll put that on my X account <laughs> and, uh, and my Facebook for you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Okay, thanks a lot.